front. Um, the three papers that you're going to hear are going to reinforce those uh, issues. Dr. Brasington is going to talk about uh, the European context of World War I in the winter and spring of 1917. Uh, his paper is going to be called uh, Turnip Winter. Dr. Brian Bazzini is going to discuss uh, tensions along the American-Mexican border. His paper is going to be about the Zimmerman telegram in the context of the Mexican Revolution. I would imagine that he may have a visual or two of Pancho Villa, uh, which is always a good way to get everybody's attention. And Dr. Brian Ingrazia is going to tell us about what's happening in the United States uh, immediately after the declaration of war. So he's going to focus more and more in on the home front. And after we have our presentations, uh, then the panel is going to come up here. I will join them. And we will throw it open to a question and answer session. Um, and feel free to share. Um, feel free to ask us questions about any aspect of World War I. We'll do the best we can uh, to answer your questions. We will not guarantee that we can. It's incredibly complicated. All right. When I was a kid, I thought World War I was fought by old men without, without, in a world without color. All of World War I vets I knew were old men, including my grandfather. Sometimes my mom would tell me that my granddad, my papa, fought in the trenches. She would do that in hushed tones. Other times she would tell me that he'd been wounded. And occasionally she would share with me that he had been gassed twice. To me, when I was about five or six years old and first heard these stories, it sounded like a great adventure. I was going through an underground fort stage, and so trench warfare didn't sound all that bad. It wasn't until I reached adolescence that I realized that World War I was fought by young men, and that because I was old enough to see my friend's big brother serve in Vietnam, and there were young people I knew as a result of that who didn't come home. In high school, I'd already fallen in love with history. And I tried on numerous occasions to talk to my granddad about the trenches, about the war. He would always dismiss my questions. He would always dismiss my queries in his Tennessee draw. He would change the subject. But there was one thing that he would talk about, and that was the voyage home. In July of 1919, he sailed for America aboard the Pocahontas having served one year in the American Expeditionary Force. An influenza epidemic immediately broke out on the ship, and the medics declared him dead when they found him comatose laying on the floor in the hold of the ship. When the burial detail took him topside, he stirred and it spared his life. They left him on the deck in the fresh salt air, and he told me of seeing hundreds and hundreds of bodies of young Americans and in his words quote stacked like cordwood along both sides of the ship one by one being committed to the deep 24 hours a day all the way across the Atlantic despite my best efforts he never talked about the trenches and now I think I understand why he couldn't he didn't have the words he didn't have the emotions to describe the horror of what he had seen, felt, somehow survived. As an early 20th century man, he was expected to simply put his experiences behind him and carry on. And so he did. He buried the horrors of World War I down deep. And he's no longer here to tell this story. People have asked me why it's important to commemorate the 100th anniversary of America's entry into World War I, and I wish I had a simple answer, but I don't. But I do know this. The men who fought 
and the women who nursed and comforted them when they were scared or when they were maimed or stricken with influenza far from home. They're no longer here to tell us about it. The 370 young men from West Texas State Normal College who served in the American Expeditionary Force. And here are some of their pictures, volunteers from 1917. They're no longer here to tell their stories. The 2,645 soldiers from the Texas Panhandle are not here to tell their stories. 196,000 young men from Texas who served in the AEF overseas, they're no longer here to tell their stories. Neither are the 2.3 million men who went overseas in the American Expeditionary Force or the 4.7 million in the armed forces combined. None of them are here to tell their stories. So it falls to us. I don't have a simple answer as to why it's important to commemorate America's entry into the war. I wish I did. I've been asked the question many times, but I don't have a simple answer. And fortunately, another historian by the name of Jackson Marshall III asked the right people why it was important. Because he asked the veterans themselves. He published a book based upon oral histories of veterans who'd served in World War I. Men in their 70s, men in their 80s. He interviewed these men in the, in the 1970s, 1980s. They were all from North Carolina. And that's where my granddad was from. And he interviewed these old doughboys about their wartime experiences. And he said that, he, that, the, that the men that he interviewed hoped that readers would gain a greater understanding of why they fought and of the sacrifices they and many others of their generation made for our futures. They did what they thought was best for their country. They went to war. Marshall writes, this 19th century war fought in the early 20th century destroyed the idealism of a young generation of Americans. World War I was not that long ago, the veterans pointed out, but they feared that their sacrifices were already forgotten. These North Carolinians wished to leave behind this, their testament of a sacrificed generation, so that they are not completely forgotten by a hurried future. That's why we're here tonight. Dr. Brazington. Thank you, Dr.